Ephesians chapter 3, you should be um, working through our previous outline. There are a number of things that we want to make sure that we cover tonight by God's mercy, if we can, <clears throat> as we seek to enter into the apostles' passion for the church, not only at Ephesus, but around the world. So we will once again revisit verses 16 through 19. We might even make it through 21. I don't know. Let's open in a word of prayer and see what God does for us. <clears throat> so, Father, we thank you again for your grace to gather your people who are often typically and by virtue of necessity scattered abroad for work and other chores, other activities that encompass our life. But in that great uh, typical pattern of gathering your people on the last day, you gather us several times a week. And we are so thankful for the gathering together of the saints, especially as we see the day drawing nearer. You grant us grace to do that by inclining our hearts. And now that we are in your audience, we are asking for your mercy and your grace to help us to honor you as the King of Kings, as the Lord of Lords, as the mediator between God and man, as the revelation of the invisible God, and as our total and complete salvation. As we enter into your word tonight, grant us, O oh Lord, an understanding heart, grant us a perception of mind, grant us a, uh, a joy of soul as we look into that which is the passion of your servant's heart, the purpose of your will and the expectation of your people. So we come to you once again realizing our ineptness, our weakness, flaws, and uh, every disability that we could have, and we ask that you would set it aside, that you would purge it, cleanse it, wash it, uh, sprinkle us clean in our heart, soul, mind by the blood of Christ and by your righteousness, which only comes by the water of the word and by the power of your spirit. Uh, in our renewal, oh God, we ask that you continue to grow us up. We know that faith comes by hearing, so we're asking that you give us ears to hear tonight. And we know that joy, joy comes by believing, so we ask that you open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things out of your law. Remove every unnecessary distraction from us. You are the most important thing at this moment. We pray your mercies upon the whole body of Christ around the world. And for those that are yet coming, give them, oh God, grace to come and grace to be. For our brothers and sisters watching and listening, we ask that you would meet them with the same measure of grace that you would meet us and the body of Christ around the world. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to revisit just for a foundational reading, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 through 19. Actually, I'll read through 21, and then we'll come back and start working through what we have been engaging our thoughts in for the last several weeks. Verse 16, the Apostle Paul says he is praying. In fact, let me start back at verse 14, since it's been a while. For this cause I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to, to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Thus is the reading of God's word. Eloquent words, as some theologians have stated before, probably one of the most involved, enriched, and passionately focused prayers that are, that are written by the Apostle Paul. Probably one of the most involved and passionate and focused prayers that are written by the Apostle Paul. Paul is one, like many of our uh, brothers in Scripture, who prayed a lot. And we have his prayers all through the epistles um, and beyond, and so he sets for us a, a high watermark of how we ought to commune with God in prayer consistently. But over the last several weeks, one of the things we have been doing 
is making sure that we have paid attention to what we are calling the passion of Paul in his prayer for the purpose of God to be manifested in our life and for us to understand our expectation of him in Christ for God's glory and our honor. So what that means is that we actually value what Paul is doing here, not only for the church at Ephesus, but for the whole church, because by implication, we know he is praying for us too. And when a man or a woman comes to value prayer, they value the prayers of the people of God. And we value what Paul is saying because what Paul is saying has enormous significance to us. We started off last time acknowledging that his prayer began in verse 16 with a desire for God to give us something. That's what our little word grant means. His desire was that God would grant you, and the you is always in the context of speaking in the epistles, the plural form, you all. So not you individually, but you all, because this is an ecclesiastical prayer. This is a prayer for the church, the body of Christ, the believers collectively. So as you work through this text with me over the next couple of weeks, think in terms of the whole body, not just yourself. The key to understanding the majesty and fullness <clears throat> of this text is to realize that this is a body prayer. This is a church prayer. This is a prayer for every member of the body. And somewhere, therefore, in that body, you exist if you are a believer in Christ. And therefore, he says, I am praying that God would grant you all, in verse 15, 16, that you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. We took the implications of that and we drew them out and we stated it this way. You and I need God's grace to be strengthened on our inside, to be strengthened in our new man, our inner man, in order for the things of God to take place in our life. Even if we are a new creature in Christ, even if we are born again, it does not follow that necessarily because we are born again, we can accomplish the things that God wants for us to do in our lives. It does mean we are qualified to do them. It means that we are positioned to do them. It means that God has uh, put us in a place, as Paul says in Romans, Ephesians chapter 1, where he has made us accepted in the beloved. It means that we are qualified to be in God's presence, but it does not mean that automatically I am going to achieve or perform the things that God has purposed for me without his strength. So what verse four, uh, 16 is really underscoring is that Paul is praying that the people of God would pursue God for that very power and strength to do what God has called them to do. And so we worked through the whole idea of God strengthening us, and we saw that he began to speak to not only his desire that that would occur, that God would draw from the riches of his glory and pour into the life of the people of God what is necessary for them to do what they have to do. But he begins to categor categorically define how that falls out or how that works. The first thing that he said that we need to have taking place in our life is given to us in verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Do you guys see that? So remember, we are dealing with uh, purpose clauses here. In this context, it's in order that. I am praying in order that something might happen. And the first thing that he's praying for is that Christ might dwell. And remember what we said that word dwelt meant? It meant that he might make his, himself what? At home in your heart that Christ might be at home in your heart. And that's an amazing thing because it would be assumed that if you and I are Christians and believers in Christ, that he does have his home in our heart. But if we remember what John said in John chapter 15, that the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. And in that context, we learn that there was a fundamental imperative that Christ gave to the disciples to remember and then to share with the church. That if the branch is going to bear fruit, it must what? Abide in the vine. 
So if you're going to take anything away from the lesson as we work it through today, the imperative for us as believers is to abide. To abide in what? The vine. Or who? Christ. Now, if we abide in Christ, according to John chapter 15, Christ will abide in us. But then we were told that there is an instrumental means by which that occurs. It's not mystical. It's not something that happens uh, sort of in an um, ethereal way. We don't just say, Lord Jesus, abide in me. And then he abides. The Lord Jesus doesn't say, abide in me, and then we abide in him. There is an instrumental means by which Christ in, abides in the believer and the believer abides in Christ. Who knows what that instrumental means is? The word of God. It is the word of God. It is the word of God. So if Christ is going to dwell in our hearts, he's going to dwell in our hearts by his word. Let's look at it again. John chapter uh, 15, so that we make sure that we understand that the instrumental means is essential to this occurring. I'm going to read uh, John chapter 15, verse 6. Here it is. Um, I'll start back. Uh, it's at verse 7, really. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Do you see it? If you abide in me and my words abide in you. This is like the third time Christ spoke this. He says it over in verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. So there is a him, us, abiding that takes place in order for fruit to be born. But he qualifies that in verse 7 by saying, if you abide in me, and what? My words abide in you. You shall ask what you will. Now, when my sister... Uh, uh, stated that we are to allow Christ to abide in our hearts. And then she said, what? By faith. By faith can only mean what? Through the word of God. Right? Why? Because faith comes by what? And hearing by what? So there is no automatic faith relationship between us and Christ apart from God's word. And we would also state that if faith as it is organic can diminish or grow to the degree that you and I are paying attention to God's word relative to God speaking to us. Is that proposition legitimate? That my faith is strong to the degree that the word of God is abiding in me. To the degree that God's word is not abiding in me, my faith is diminished. Does that make sense? Right. It's not only fundamentally true, it's essentially true. So what we want to make sure is that when we read in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, he prays that God would grant us, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by the spirit in the inner man, in order that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. What he is saying is, Lord, grant the people of God a level of hunger and attention for your word so that the word of God which is the means by which faith is communicated, might lay hold of the Christ of the scriptures and that Christ become a reality in their life. In other words, Christ is only a reality in our life as Lord, as Savior, as sovereign, as glorious, as all-encompassing, as all-needing to the degree that the word of God is in our heart, right? So we read in Psalm 119, around verse 9, Thy word, or wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not, what? Sin against thee. In several places in the Psalms, David makes it clear how important the word of God is. Again, in Psalm 119, the entrance of your word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. And so the word of God must have its way and its home in my heart for me to really know Christ in the truth. Now, again, the importance of this is what Christ had said to the Jews. Remember in John chapter 8, he says, how come you don't understand my speech? It's because my word is not in you. If my word was in you, you would know who I am and you would know where I came from. But I can tell you that you don't know me nor the one from whom I came because my word does not abide in you. And so it's very important that the people of God have a working knowledge of biblical truth. I'm hoping to expand on that more today. But this is a critical problem, I believe, in the church where we have this subtle relationship with God where the word of God doesn't really play a central role in that relationship. Where, where, where professing Christians have a way about talking about God and being with God 
without that being concretely affirmed by a diligent and radical and consistent abiding in God's word. Now, where that is the case, those people are like Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, they are building their house on sand rather than on solid rock. And this is something we want to make sure that we don't find ourselves doing because this is the relentless battle that takes place in the spiritual dimension for all of us. If it's one thing that the enemy wants you and I to do is distance ourselves from the word. If it's one thing he wants you to do is to develop a lifestyle where you become comfortable at distance from God's word. Because he understands the power of the word. He understands the efficacy of it. He understands its depths, its ability, its aim and objective. He knows that the man or the woman that is deeply and richly committed to God's word is going to be the individual who is actually transformed into the image of Christ. He knows that. And this is why Colossians 3.16 tells us to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And so this is Paul's prayer. Now, why would Paul be pain, praying passionately about the dwelling of Christ in their hearts by faith like this? Well, because of the context in which the believer lives at all times. And that is trouble, tribulation, trials, difficulties, temptations, adversities. All kinds of afflictions beset the people of God. And if the people of God are going to make it through this world, they're going to have to know what David meant when David said in Psalm 119, again, the third or fourth division, he says, remember the word unto your servant. Bring the word of God back to me, O God, upon which I have hope. This is my comfort in my affliction because your word is what gives me life. That's what David said. David said, and take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth. I'm a stranger in the earth. Don't hide your commandments from me. I have enemies everywhere. Don't take your word out of my mouth. And remember what Jesus said in Matthew 15. Out of the abundance of the heart doth the what? Mouth speak. You're going to always find that the Christian that prospers in their walk with God, that matures in their walk with God, that grows and becomes fruitful and productive for the kingdom of God, is going to be the man or the woman that's really committed to God's word. All right, so let's go on and work through this. Little, so again, make sure you understand that this is not kind of a taking of the rock and skipping it on the top of the water. That's not the kind of walk you want with God. God's people are not like rocks that skip on the top of the water. God's people are like whales that swim deep down into the riches of God's sea abyss of divine grace called the scriptures. We go deep because we want all that God wants for us by our abiding in him through his word. And so we go on to say, not only that he might dwell in our hearts by faith, that is through the word of God, but that being what? Rooted and grounded in what? Love. Right, so we talked about that before, that whole idea of being rooted and grounded. Rooted is agricultural and is speaking to the metaphor of the what? Tree. And then uh, grounded is the metaphor of the architectural and is speaking to what? A building. So if we're rooted, that means we are like a tree planted by the rivers of water whose roots go down deep. Psalm 1, verse 3 and 4, right? His roots go down deep. His roots go down deep and tap into the water source, which river represents the spirit of the living God that gives nourishment to the roots and, and it therefore strengthens the branches and brings forth fruit to God's glory, right? That's Psalm 1, verse 1, 2, and 3. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers, rivers of water that brings forth fruit, his fruit in its season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall what? All right, so look at verse 3. That's called a promise for those of you who are learning how to handle your Bibles. That's a promise. And I do want you to mark that this is what we call a conditional promise. The prosperity is predicated upon the conditions met, that the root of the soul goes deep down into the water bed of the Spirit of God so that the Word of God, working by the Spirit of God, can produce in us branches that bear fruit. You guys see that, right? Critical. Critical to the outpouring. And then the next metaphor is the metaphor of the house. And we've been talking about that, and I want to develop that as we make our way through. 
He says rooted and grounded. And the word grounded literally means to be established, to be established. And that again is Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and following. Uh, go there for a moment just to see it. And then we'll look at one more verse. And then I want to carry you into uh, the next thought that Paul has around this since we're simply recapping right now. In Matthew chapter 7, notice what our Lord Jesus says in that great Magna Carta of a series of sermons in the Sermon on the Mount. He says in verse 21, he says, Not every one that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in your name cast out devils and in your name done many works? And he will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever hear these words, hear these sayings of mine and do with them. I will liken him unto a wise man, which what? Built his house upon a rock. Very simple proposition. When God's word is taught, proclaimed, preached, the heart has to be able to receive it in what we call the obedience of faith. Very simple proposition. Where you are privileged to be under the hearing of the word of God and it is taught accurately and properly, you want to pray that your heart is receptive of that truth. Because upon receiving that truth, that truth inherently will do what it promises to do. So what you and I always want to say whenever we come under the hearing of the word of God, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Do not assume that just because you are under the hearing, your heart is ready to receive. It may very well not be ready to receive. And so that's something that you have to humbly and prayerfully be careful to watch when you are under the word. You and I want to profit from the word. We want to benefit from the word. All of Israel, with the exception of God's elect, failed to enter into the promised land, according to Hebrews 3, because the word was not mixed with faith in those that heard it. So they perished in the wilderness because of what? Unbelief. So when you and I are hearing the word of God, and it's actually the word of God, rightly divided, rightly taught, what you and I are to ask the Lord is, Lord, give me hearing ears, give me seeing eyes, give me a receptive heart. And that's what Paul is praying for. He's praying for that. And so let's uh, notice what he says concerning the calamity, and then we'll go back. He says, and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it did not what? Fall, for it was what? Founded upon a rock. Oh, yeah. Now notice what he's stating. The importance of building the house upon a rock is because these trials are going to come to prove whether or not you actually believe God. Do you see it? And then he goes on to say, and everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall thereof. Lesson, whether you are a fool or a wise man, storms are coming. God does not bring storms to the fool and give blessings to the wise. The storms are coming both to the fool and the wise. It's just that the wise prepared for their coming, making sure that they built their house upon a solid rock, and that rock is who? Right. It's Christ, and it's through his word, and it's by his spirit. So go with me back to Ephesians chapter 3 now, and let's begin to work through this just a tad bit more and understand the passionate prayer of Paul for the work of the Spirit of God to plant Christ in the heart at the level of rooting and grounding us so that we might indeed advance into the blessings that are ours in this, uh, in this set of promises that are given to us in chapter 3. So we've already acknowledged that Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith is the work of God. It really is that Christ might dwell in our hearts by faith has to be the work of the Father and of the Son of the spirit rather through the word of God and then the result will be that we will be rooted and we will be grounded and notice that last adjective in what love rooted and grounded in love so remember faith always works by what love. faith always works by what love. faith always works by what love. that's Galatians chapter 5 and uh, verse 5 and 6 it's always a fundamental premise that where faith is love is its basis Love is going to always be the fuel of faith. It was what Christ required of Peter when he fell and he recommissioned Peter in John 21. He said, Peter, do you believe in me? 
No, he didn't. He said, Peter, do you love me? Right? He didn't ask Peter whether or not he believed. He knew Peter believed. He asked Peter whether or not he loved him. Because the fuel that fires faith is love. It's the love of God that's shed in the heart of the people of God, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 5, by the Holy Spirit. And that love, then, is what strengthens our faith. It's what sustains our faith. It's God's love in us. We love him because he what? first loved us. So this is a love affair. And here is the beautiful thing about what Paul is doing as he's pressing into his passionate desire for the Ephesians and therefore for us, is that he really wants the Ephesians to grow in their love for God the Father, through God the Son, by God the Holy Spirit, in order that they might experience the love of God in Christ that's for them. It is a reciprocating relationship of love for and love because. Because God loved us, therefore we love him back. And that reciprocating relationship has as its accruing benefits God bringing us into depths of knowledge about him that actually strengthen our faith and increase us in the knowledge of God. Let's see if we can make that good. Going then again to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. So we are asking the apostle is asking that Christ may dwell in their hearts by faith, that ye, that is the church as a whole, being rooted and grounded in love, now watch this, may be able to what? Comprehend. So this is, uh, this is like second to the third of what, or actually is about third to the fourth of what Paul has been requesting for the uh, Ephesian church and therefore for us. And this is the line that I really want us to grasp. He's praying that the spirit would work in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you would be rooted and grounded in love in order that you might comprehend something. So do you see all the prerequisites to comprehending? Do you see all the prerequisites to comprehending? So now what I want you to think about with me as we work through comprehension is that this is not merely an intellectual comprehension. This is not merely God increasing your capacity to be um, um, objectively aware of certain biblical facts. The idea here is really profound. The term here to comprehend means to grasp. It means to eagerly receive. The root verb is columbano, and it's a very common uh, verb, which means to receive. And as many as received him, to them gave him the power, them the power to become the sons of God. So here's what I want you to grasp. When it says, in order that they might be able, again, may be able is a verb. And it means to actually be strengthened in a way of which you will overcome all of the obstacles entering into your life because... You have received eagerly the things concerning Christ that make for your salvation. So I'm going to say it again so that this can come home. The implication of what Paul is stating in verse 18 is that when you and I arrive at an eagerly embracing, an eagerly receiving, uh, an eagerly taking to ourselves that which Christ has for us, it's because by his grace, we have overcome everything in the world that seeks to hinder us from that very objective. So, again, this is how this goes. The things that God has for them that love him are theirs as they fight and press into it through all of the obstacles that come against their walk with God. It might be said like this as we get ready to tap into the implications of this verse, which is probably going to be the majority of our talk tonight. There will be saints who on this side of eternity miss the blessing of the depths of the riches of the glory of God in Christ because they did not press into them in a manner in which all of those prerequisites required the word of God abiding. Christ dwelling in the heart by faith, that faith being strengthened by love, the spirit of God working on the inner man in order that they might be rooted and grounded in faith. Now, rooted and grounded in faith can be um, also explained under another term, mature, mature, in order that in their maturity, 
having overcome trials and tribulations by faith, they might have access into depths and riches of the knowledge of Christ that are exclusively for those who have endured trials and temptations. Let me see if I can make this good. So may be able to comprehend with all the saints that we might be able to comprehend. And so in your outline, if, we're, if, we, if we have our PowerPoint up, um, I think we have that, that concept there that I just want to draw out that we might be able to comprehend. I have radical accomplishment. It's something that God has to do. It means to take hold of and eagerly receive. Let me see if I can use a few verses to underscore it. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 5, this is the way that John used this verb in its root form, and I just want you to see it. And I think the implication is going to be clear. In John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 5, are we there? And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness, what? Comprehended it not. So he's using a metaphor of the light of the gospel of the person of Christ coming into the world. But now watch this. The world did not understand, nor grasp, nor come to, as it were, recognize who Christ was. So the light was shining in darkness, but the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, if you and I are darkness, we will not comprehend the light. Right. So there is a sort of battle here around natures, the nature of light and the nature of darkness. And what what John is saying in terms of the book of John was, is this, Christ came to his own, the Jewish people, but because the word of God did not abide in their heart, they did not understand Christ's words. And therefore, because they did not understand Christ's words, they did not see him as the light of the world. And because they did not see him as the light of the world, all of the promises of the blessings of the gospel that those who did see or hear, they did not have. This light came and this light went. And the Jewish people who were merely religious missed the revelation of the glory of God in the person of Christ. Are you guys with me? Amen. They missed it. They missed it. And this is something that Christ was constantly teaching to his disciples. You know, it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but not to those that are without. Again, Matthew chapter, well, I don't want to go there right now. Let's look at another verse. Go with me now in your Bible to um, John chapter 12, verse 35. And let's see if we can make good on this verb again as being that which ascertains, apprehends, eagerly receives, gladly welcomes the truth of God when it's communicated to them providentially by the word of God. Here it is. In John chapter 12, 35, then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while the light is with you. Walk while you have the light. Do you see it? Lest darkness come upon you, for he that walketh in darkness does not know where he goes. Christ was telling the disciples, while the light is with you, walk with that light. Commune with that light. Agree with that light. Fellowship with that light. Enter into the abiding with that light and the light with you so that you have the benefit of that light leading you into the green pastures of redemptive realities and truths that the light promises to do. Here's another way this word is used in Acts chapter 4 verse 13. Acts chapter 4 13. This here is an observation that's made, I believe, by the rulers around this idea of comprehending, and it'll serve for us now as well. So here it is. Uh, I'll, yeah, verse 13. Now, when they, that is the rulers, saw the boldness of Peter and John. Now, you remember, Peter just woke up to boldness, didn't he? And we might say that's true with the other uh, ten as well, remember? Because they all ran a few days ago. Today, they're bold. Why are they bold today? And I'll tell you why. Because Ephesians chapter 3, verse 15 and 16 is working now. Remember what Paul said? I am praying that God would strengthen you on the inner man by his spirit. And remember what Christ told the disciples to do? To wait until they be endued with power from on high. Then you will be my what? Witnesses. So the spirit of God is now working in the, the apostles, whereas Prior to that, while Christ was exclusively accomplishing the work of redemption so that the disciples could not partake of the advancement of that exclusive work, they failed. They failed because they didn't have the power. 
They didn't fail because they weren't believers. They failed because the Spirit of God, the third person, was not occupying their heart at the level of Christ dwelling in them to give them that light, that clarity, that boldness to talk about Jesus. So here you go from John chapter 18, them failing, to Acts chapter 4, and they are now boldly declaring the gospel. Now I want you to mark what the leaders say. Now when they, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, that is, they didn't go to any of the schools of the Jewish leaders, neither the liberal schools nor the conservative schools, and all of a sudden these men are speaking with power and eloquence. They perceived, see the word perceived? That's our word. They perceived, they took knowledge of them, that is, that they had been with Jesus. They, and perceived that they were unlearned. The word perceived there is they grasped or they comprehended that they were unlearned, ignorant men, and they marveled that they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So this word perceived is giving the idea as well of them having analyzed Peter and John, realizing what they were, realizing what they are and assessing they had to be with Jesus. Now here's another way to uh, understand this word. It's in Acts chapter 25. I like this context. I'm not going to expand on it, but I'm just making our way through our account in order to um, sort of explain just a little bit what we mean by comprehending with all the saints. And we'll go back there in a moment. This is Acts chapter 25, verse 25. Acts 25, 25, and I'm going to start back at verse 24. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all men which are here present with us, see ye this man, talking about Paul, of whom all the multitude of the Jews have, have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought not to live any longer. And I don't want to kill Paul. Notice, but when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and that he himself had appeared to Augustus, I have determined to send him away. And when I had found that he had done nothing, when I had found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, that idea I found is our same word to perceive or to comprehend or to discover or to know and to receive a conclusion that states, this man didn't do anything wrong. You know what that means? He, he investigated Paul's case. He analyzed it clearly, and he realized there's nothing here. So now what Paul is saying in our text is he wants you and I to analyze. He wants us to study. He wants us to press into. And to do that, you have to be interested. You have some lawyers that are interested in getting you off. So they're going to do all that they can to really study your case, look for the loopholes against those who want to indict you. Then you're going to have some lawyers that don't really care. They just want a paycheck. Right. They are not going to be serious and diligent about finding out what the facts are about your case in order to do a legitimate defense of your person with regards to wanting to get you out of the danger of the accusations that are leveled against you. Again, we'll use one more. Go with me in your Bible to uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse uh, 14. Philippians 3, 14. The Apostle Paul uses the term here again, and it simply means that you have a level of interest in the things that are before you, that it results in you knowing what you are talking about. Philippians 3.14, you guys have heard this verse before, but let it settle in your head. Let me actually it's verse 13. Listen to what it said. Brethren, I count myself not to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the high calling which is in Christ Jesus. And let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. If anything and if anything be otherwise minded, God shall do what? Reveal this unto you. Look at verse 16. Never nevertheless whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. So what the apostle is saying, and, and it actually it's in verse 12, not as though I had already uh, attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may what? Apprehend that which for which I am apprehended of Christ. That's our word. And so what Paul says is he's pressing toward the apprehension. So it's not only intellectual, it's experiential. 
Like it's one thing to comprehend, it's another thing to apprehend. It's one thing to comprehend, it's another thing to apprehend. And so this is what he says. I, I am, he says, not as though I am already, have already attained, either were already perfect or mature, but I do what? Follow after, if that I may what? All right, so that's what he's talking about. He's talking about following after to apprehend, to get it at the level of experiential knowledge, not just kind of a casual knowledge, but a real experiential knowledge that's essential to what Paul is actually saying to the church at Ephesus. Go back to Ephesians chapter three and let's listen again to what he states here. And then let's consider what he does with this idea of apprehension. He says in verse 18, that we may be able to comprehend with all saints. Do you see it? What is the breadth and length and depth and height? So now we go, what is he talking about? So what comes to your mind when, when you hear the term breadth, length, depth, and height? A building, right? A building. What else could it be? Right. He has now cast upon our thinking a metaphor of a building. And he's giving us a measure that doesn't have a numerical value to it, but it, it implies us knowing something about its breath. Now, what is a breath? It's the width of a thing, right? It's the width of a thing. And then it's depth. What is that talking about? The depth of a thing, how deep down it goes, right? And then it talks about not only the, uh, but he starts with the breath, then he goes to the length. That is how long a thing is. How long it is so he has this width in mind then he has this length in mind then he has this what depth in mind and then he has what height. right so in my mind I see almost like a triangular box why I don't know because we don't have a number on the length the length and the depth and the width and the height could all be the same size therefore I could be thinking of a what a box right so he doesn't give us numbers, but he does call our attention to be intrigued by something that he calls the love of Christ. Well, look at it. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. You see it? So go back with me to verse 18. Let's work through this just a little bit. So we've already admitted that in verse 16 that Paul is praying that God, according to the riches of his glory, would strengthen the people of God with power, with might. We talked about that before, right? Kratos, by the, uh, the, in, this, in this context, strengthen Kratos with might, might dunamis, by the spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. So we have to have the spirit of God to do that. In order that being rooted and grounded or matured in love, we may be able to apprehend or comprehend or receive eagerly and embrace watch this with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height I would submit to you that what Paul is doing is in, in, exposing us to a paradigm in scripture that goes all the way back to the beginning and it's actually partially something that he's talked about before in Ephesians chapter 2, he's going to talk about again in Ephesians chapter 4. And it's something that the scriptures talk about from the beginning of time um, all the way to the end of time. If you might be persuaded with me that what this thing called the breadth and the length and the depth and the height that Paul is addressing, which comes under the rubric of the love of God, and it's something that all saints are collectively called upon to experience. If, if, if you embrace that proposition with me, might Paul be talking about the temple? Right, so I want you to stay with me a little bit because I think that actually is what he is stating. And I'll tell you why. Because he uses the terminology of measuring. When he says that we might comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, I think what Paul is saying to the believer is that 
He wants them to know what he knows about the universal work of grace in the person of Christ through the gospel to make a people to the praise of the glory of God's grace called the church of the living God or the body of Christ or the temple of the living God. All right, so stay with me as we work through this idea. And, and, and what's fascinating to me about this is two things. All of the hard work that Paul did in his prayer that this would occur. His prayer that the Spirit of God would work in our heart. That Christ would stay in our hearts, be rooted on the throne of our hearts. That we would be matured because Christ is present in our heart. And that we would be grounded and rooted in such a way that we would be able to comprehend with all the saints this thing he calls the love of God, which I am calling the temple motif. The temple. Now, why am I saying that? Why am I saying that it's the temple? Well, first and foremost, because that's what he has called us as God's house in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 and 21. Look at it. Ephesians 2, 20 and 21. He says, and I'll start back at verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the what of God? And of the what of God? Right. So he's introducing into the equation of the gathering of Jews and Gentiles into one body uh, by virtue of the blood and righteousness of Christ. He's introducing the metaphor of a house. Now, whenever you and I talk about the house of God, the house of God, we are talking about a what? You guys got that? Those are synonyms. Because wherever God is, it is a sacred, holy place. So stay with me now because we're getting ready now. Put our feet down and go through the scriptures and learn something about how God wants you and I to be able to know his love as it is manifested in the redemption of the saints under this eternal concept called the temple of the living God. This is what he wants us to understand, saturate our minds in, investigate at the level of interest that is willing to go into the temple and learn all aspects of the temple so that we would know the love of God that's revealed to us in the temple metaphor. So in verse 20, it says these words, and you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, right? Jesus Christ himself being the what? And did we not work through that now a couple of weeks ago? We corresponded with 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 through 7, that Peter said that we are a spiritual house, built up a spiritual house. We are lively stones in that temple. So Paul is using the metaphor of a temple here, as he did in 1 Corinthians 3, as he did in 1 Corinthians 6. And he's using the metaphor of a temple here, right? And then in Ephesians chapter 6, he's telling us... We, he wants us, or the Spirit of God wants us to know something of this temple intimately. Now notice what he says in verse 21. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a what? Holy temple in the Lord. Now let me submit to you that that statement right there is also what Paul wants you and I to know about. He doesn't only want you and I to know that there is a temple that there is a growing temple, that this temple is being put together in such a harmonious fashion, fitly joined together, but he wants you to know it experientially. He wants, to, he wants you and I to know about this growing temple called the, the, the house of God, not just in terms of it being declared to you, but you experiencing it. Are you guys following me so far? Right, so this is why he is stating what he's stating over in Ephesians chapter uh, um, 3, verse 16. Look at it again, verse 18 rather. That you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. So I know that God has a house. I know that he has a temple. I know that God has always had a temple. I know that the temple has been something that God has been contemplating and working through as a scheme of redemption 
from before the foundation of the world. Do you believe that? Right. In fact, I believe that the term temple is the grand objective of God for all eternity. I believe the idea of a temple being the dwelling place of God and the dwelling place of the people of God and the dwelling place of the blessed is what God conceived before the world began and is bringing to pass in time now and will usher into eternity with. So the idea of a temple is something that I am going to call a uh, archetype. What do we mean by archetype? That it's something that God had in his mind before the world began. A temple. A temple. How do we know that? The Hebrew writer tells us in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5 that when God told Moses to build the tabernacle in the wilderness, that he was to build that tabernacle after the pattern that was shown him in the mount. You guys remember that? Where it says here, where who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the what? For see, saith he, that you make all things according to the what? Pattern shown you in the mount. So there was a pattern before there was a tabernacle, right? So I call this the archetype. And that means that the pattern or the archetype was in the mind of God because it was revealed to Moses from heaven, right? Where was the second sort of type or prototype of the temple manifested in scripture? What would we call that sort of uh, primal type of the temple, the dwelling place of God, the, the dwelling place of the people of God, the, 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 that, that dimension or realm where the people of God enjoy God and God enjoy the people of God. Where would that be? That's good. I would say the garden, the garden of Eden. Right, so stay with me for a moment. I believe that there are seven manifestations, six actually, but seven in that the archetypal pattern uh, uh, gives us these stages of God's objective and purpose in Christ for having a people for himself in a kind of temple metaphor, temple motif all through scripture, that the stages of redemptive history always have as its center God as the dwelling place of the people of God and the people of God as the community of God with God. And that is what we would call a temple motif. And I believe that the garden is a temple motif. I believe that the Garden of Eden is where God dwelt with man and man worshiped God and God enjoyed man and fellowship with man in that place where man had all of the blessings of God bestowed upon him. And that would be the garden. The garden would be the place where Adam and Eve would have worshiped God, where God would have revealed himself to them, where he would have manifested his glory where they would have enjoyed communion with God, been instructed by God how to walk with God. This is a pre-fall uh, scenario, but it is not contradictory to God's temple motif. And why do I say that? Because the garden motif recovers itself again in what we call the eschatological temple of Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 4, right? That same garden motif is there. Revelation chapter 22, verses 1, 2, and 3. Can you go there for a second? So I would say that the final eschatological temple is seen in Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 3. Or actually, you know what? Make it chapter 21 all the way through 20, verses 1 through and 3. So stay right here. Look what it says. And he showed me a pure river of water of what? Does that not go back to the garden? Right, because in the garden there were four rivers that ran through the garden and watered the whole earth. Remember that? So you have the water motif there. A clear, uh, clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Here now we have that motif of the sovereign God and the sovereign Savior who is the Lamb in the middle of or in the midst of God's people, in the midst of this paradise of God. By the way, was that throne and was God's rule in the garden at the beginning of time? Absolutely. You don't have to actually see a throne to know that God was sovereign. God created the heavens and the earth. 
Genesis 1 and 2 clearly lay out the sovereign triune God as being present and sovereignly ruling. And then in their decree, they made man on the sixth day for man to enjoy God and for God to enjoy man in God's paradise, as it were, typologically. So the garden is a paradise type. I don't call it actually paradise, but I call it a paradise type. And notice what it says in verse 2. So it says, and in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the what? Tree of life. There it is. So for those of you who haven't heard it before, uh, protology is those things that declare beforehand what will actually take place in time. And eschatology is the fulfillment or the last in or the um, totality of or the accomplishment of what God had purposed before. So God speaks those things that are not as if they were because with God, the end is comprehended from the beginning. Now that pattern runs through the scripture. Now, that pattern runs through the scripture to help God's people understand several things. One is God is unchangeable. The other thing is that his redemptive plan is not plans A, B, C, and D. They're all one linear plan. And therefore, for the people of God, they can actually take confidence in God because God knows from the beginning how it's going to all work out. And then when God communicates to us, he communicates by way of revelation in the continuity and consistency of patterns. So that he's not really saying anything new. He may be augmenting or emphasizing, but he's not saying anything new. It's one word, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's the same thing from the beginning. So we have an archetype in God's mind. Then we have the garden uh, Eden, Garden of Eden temple motif that I am arguing based upon the seventh model and that's Revelation 21 uh, through uh, Revelation 22 verses 1, 2, and 3. Let me read the third verse here. Verse 3, just verse 3 of Revelation 22 if you can pull it up. So we better go in our Bibles. There it is. And there shall be no more what? But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Now, what has occurred in this text? A reversal of what happened in the garden when mankind fell in rebellion because of the instigation of the serpent. So we can see that God's eschatological objective is to establish for all eternity a dwelling place for the people of God that is Edenic in nature, but it's temple in its framework. Because according to chapter 21, Christ is the temple. God and Christ are the temple there. We don't need light. We don't need the moon. We are in eternity. And God is the temple. And we worship God in that temple. But there are, I think, four other patterns in the scripture that I want to call your attention to before I get to this word measure, which we're going to have to come back to. All right, so the archetype was in God's mind before time. The Garden of Eden is what I would call that second or first sort of typical pattern of the temple. Then which would, which would be the next one? The one that took place in the wilderness called the what? Tabernacle. By the way, if we were doing a time timetable of this, we would say that the garden of the uh, creation in a short earth theory was created around 10,000, 11,000 be years before Christ. The tabernacle that Moses built in the wilderness under the instruction of God according to Hebrews 8 5 was built in what we call about 1450 BC not quite 1500 years before Christ but about 1450 years before Christ some argue literally 1447 BC so think about this 10,000 BC creation the first temple type the second temple type is in 1500 years before Christ or 450 BC. You guys follow that? That's the tabernacle. What would be the next one? Who knows it? The temple, which we would call whose temple? Solomon's temple. That's number four, Solomon's temple. And who knows when Solomon's temple was built? It was built in 967 BC. You can just mark that down because sometimes what's impressive is for us to realize how God is patient with his redemptive purposes in time to show us that he's not in a hurry 
that his plan is working just as it ought to, and you and I have to be patient as well. So uh, we have the, the temple in the mind of God in eternity. We have the temple motif, and I'm going to call it the temple garden at creation. And people will argue these dates, but I'll go 10,000 to 13,000 B.C., okay? The next temple is what we call the tabernacle, right? The tabernacle. And the tabernacle was made in the wilderness 1,500 years before what we call B.C., literally some, somewhere around 1450 BC. So you can see how time is elapsing, right? And where are we headed? We're headed to the next one. We said now we're talking about Solomon's temple, right? And you can find that in, uh, in 1 Kings as well. Solomon's temple was built in the land of Israel or Palestine. And it was built in 967 BC somewhere around, around there. That means it was built about a thousand years before who? Before Christ. What would be that fourth temple that would we, we would call the uh, building, uh, the temple motif? Who would know? Ezekiel. The Ezekiel temple? I would say no. It was a temple before that. It was the temple of Ezra and Nehemiah and Haggai's day when it was built under the rule of the Persian Empire, when the Persian under King Cyrus told them to go back to the land, okay? So we would call that the um, Ezraite temple. The Ezraite temple. And the Ezraite temple would have been uh, built in what we call the restoration plan. Restoration temple. And we'll talk about the Ezekiel temple in a minute, my brother. And that would have been in 445 B.C. And all the language that underscores the Ezraite temple, because you guys remember Ezra was the priest. He went back to Israel and he took with him Joshua, Jeshua the high priest and Zerubbabel the, Zerubbabel the governor and they laid the foundation for the temple. But there was a lot of conflict in terms of the building of the temple because the pagans and the heathen really didn't want the temple to be built. If you guys remember that era, very, very important era. But I would assert to you that the Ezraite temple uh, was not the temple that Nehemiah had in mind. And here is the reason why, because I want to actually deal with the Ezra, I mean, the, uh, um, the Ezekiel temple. Ezra's temple, uh, Nehemiah's temple, Haggai's temple, Haggai is a small little minor prophet that was exhorting them in that time, 450, 445 BC, to rebuild the temple. But that temple that was rebuilt in the days of Ezra, in the days of Zerubbabel, in the days of Joshua or Jeshua, was not the temple that Ezekiel is talking about. And the reason why I know that is because I have allowed myself to be driven to the study of Ezekiel's temple, chapters 40 through 47, by virtue of Paul's exhortation in Ephesians 3, 18, that I might know the breadth, the depth, the length, and the height. Are you guys with me so far? And, and once I began to study that, what, I be, what, I, what became clear was that temple could not have been the temple that uh, Ezra and Nehemiah um, found themselves experiencing. And there are a whole lot of reasons for that. So Ezra, the Ezraite temple was restored in 445 BC. But what other temple then if it would not have been the Ezekian temple? How about the Herodian temple? The Herodian temple is the, is the restored Ezraite temple. Why? Because the temple was destroyed again before Jesus came. Remember when Jesus is talking with the rulers about the temple. And Jesus was saying, you know, before Abraham was, I am. And they were saying, listen, this temple that you're talking about, that's going to be destroyed. This temple has been in building for over 50 years. How is it that you're going to say that you're older than the temple? And they all were talking about Herod's temple. Now, Herod's temple was a massive, massive work. In fact, what's interesting about all these temples, 
because I really do want to leave Ezekiel's temple out for now. What's interesting about all these temples, except for the temple in eternity and the temple in the garden, in my mind, is that the temple in the wilderness could be measured. Solomon's temple could be measured. The Ezraite temple could be measured. In other words, there were literal dimensions to them. Herod's temple was measured. They knew how large Herod's temple was. In fact, it was still in building when Jesus was doing ministry. It wasn't done yet. So you have the temple in eternity, the temple in the garden, you have the tabernacle in the wilderness, you have Solomon's temple, and Solomon's temple was glorious, wasn't it? Then you have the Ezraite temple because of what happened to Solomon's temple, because of what happened to the temple, uh, the tabernacle in the wilderness, because of what happened to the temple garden, which we're going to talk about here in a moment. And then we have Herod's temple, which Herod's temple suffered the same fate that the Ezraite temple suffered, that Solomon's temple suffered, that the tabernacle in the wilderness suffered, that the garden suffered. What did it suffer? Destruction. Destruction. Destruction, didn't it? The garden was destroyed by sin. The tabernacle in the wilderness was destroyed by sin. Solomon's temple was destroyed by what? The Ezraite temple was destroyed by sin. We know this because we have the history of the Maccabeans. We have the history of Israel's rebellion in the days of Alexander the Great when he brought in the whole Hellenistic culture and Israel had apostatized it and God destroyed it. And then it began to be rebuilt under, uh, under Herod. But Herod's temple was destroyed. When was Herod's temple destroyed? A.D. 70. Is that true? I got one more for you, though, that we did not actually deal with. What temple was also destroyed that we are not considering? Christ. Look at it. John's Gospel, chapter 2, I think it's verse 20. I'll just show you something about this. I kind of am laying a foundation now for, um, for, for actually um, Paul's exhortation for us to comprehend. Notice what is stated in, uh, I'm going to start at verse 16. Are you there? This is the time when Christ came into Jerusalem. This is verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and dove and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the what? And the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers money and overthrew the ta uh, tables. He went to work, didn't he? Look at this. And he said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house had eaten me up. He's quoting from Psalm 69. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, what sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest all these things? Now, this is so dumb. Hear this brother running through the temple, tearing up everything that was contrary to the temple, and saying, my father's house is to be a house of prayer, not a den of thieves and robbers. And they're saying, what sign do you show us? The sign was going on right in front of them. The sign of his authority and right as the Lord of the temple to purge the temple as uh, Malachi had stated in Malachi chapter 3. When the Lord of the temple shall come, he shall purge the sons of Levi. This is typified by him going through the temple, cleaning it up right now. This affirmed Christ's Messiahship. But will you look at verse 19? And this is going to get into my point about the Herodian temple. Are we there? Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple and in what? Three days I will raise it up. Now, that is quite insightful because their question was about why are you messing up the Herodian temple that we are using to make a ton of money out of? And he's pointing them to spiritual reality. He's first letting them know that they were going to do what? Crucify him. 
But he's also letting them know that he is the true what? Temple. He is the true temple. But by him affirming that they were going to kill him, he is fulfilling all of the patterns of every one of the temples that go back to the garden. Are you guys tracking with me so far? This is what I meant by typology in his pattern in scripture teaching us things. So the garden was corrupted by sin and the fall and rebellion of the serpent. The temple, the tabernacle in the wilderness was corrupted by sin and rebellion and the uh, uh, acts of wicked men and their disobedience and idolatry. In the days of uh, Samuel, the temple, the tabernacle was completely devastated and destroyed. Solomon's temple ultimately corrupted and came apart some hundred years later, didn't it? In fact, not only 100 years later, some 60 years later, God had divided it. He, he told him that his son Rehoboam and Jeroboam would split the nation and, and Rehoboam would have uh, the two southern tribes and Re, uh, Jeroboam would have the ten northern tribes and Israel would be split. And then the temple of Solomon was destroyed in 587 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar came in and devastated the temple, completely demolished it in such a fashion as foreshadowed what would happen under the Roman Titus in the year AD 70. So what's happening? Temple demolishing, temple demolishing, temple demolishing. But watch this now. Every time the temple is established, it's assaulted and it's demolished. But what's the good news? It's raised up again. It's raised up again. Is raised up again. Is that right? So, so stay with me because I think this is where Paul is going about why he would want us to comprehend the, the width and the, de and the length and the depth and the height. He would want you and I to understand that God's plan of having a people for his glory called the temple of the living God, who at the center of that temple is Jesus, will constantly face assaults in this world. But the good news of the gospel is, it shall rise again. You guys got that? It shall rise again. Now this truth needs to be comprehended because without comprehending this truth, you will miss the mystery of the gospel in this world. And the mystery of the gospel in this world is this. In the world, you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Right. So, so you and I are just on the cusp of contemplating why it is that we want to press into a knowledge of God at the depth of understanding the width and the length and the depths and the heights. Are you guys with me so far? You want to be able to press into that. So I, I thought it through. So here it is. We have the eternal temple in the mind of God, the garden, garden, the tabernacle, Solomon's temple, the Ezraite temple, the Herodian temple. Certainly Christ is the temple. But are we done with temples? What's the next temple that we must consider that is critical to you and me? The church. The church. Because we are the temple of God, are we not? All right. So now, if the church is a temple motif, and it is, because Paul has plainly told us, if Christ has suffered, if the Herodian temple has suffered, if Solomon's temple has suffered, if the Ezraite temple has suffered, as the Moses temple in the wilderness has suffered, if the garden paradisio type has suffered, are we not going to suffer? Absolutely. So what do we do? Because we are facing suffering, do we flee and run or do we press into the temple and understand it more fully? You press into it to understand it more fully. Now, this is where I will say that we're going to stop for tonight. But what I'm going to do with you next week. In fact, I'll do this because I got I got five minutes. Go with me in your Bible to Ezekiel chapter 40. There are seven chapters uh, in the Ezekiel temple image that are really worth um, at least a cursory awareness of. And I'm just going to actually read a few verses out of this to kind of show you 
a few things about what I believe Paul means by our pressing into and seeking to comprehend and seeking to apprehend the glory of God's eternal plan and purpose in Christ represented in the temple motif, which temple you are in Christ. Okay, so in Ezekiel 40 through 48, and it's really 40 through 47, for those of you who have re ever read about the Ezekiel temple, it'll wear you out in your reading. And here's the reason why it will wear you out. Because you have to be committed to the kind of architect architectural knowledge and, uh, and awareness that is required for being able to measure every aspect of the temple. You have to have that sort of pay count for numbers. And you have to have something of a carpenter's skilled knowledge in order to appreciate what Ezekiel exposes us to. But you won't need that tonight. I'm just going to give you just a little bit of a taste of this idea of pressing into that for which God has apprehended us. I just want you to get it a little bit with me, okay? Uh, and then maybe we'll do a little bit more work on this next time, although maybe not. I, I was thinking as I was working through these seven chapters that they would be rich messages to develop and preach to us to help us understand the eternal counsel of God and the salvation of his people, which is sure to us because the way God sees a thing is the way that it is. Now, I'm going to see if I can lay the context for this proposition. Um, in Romans chapter 8, the Bible tells us, if God be for us, what? Right. And that is on the heels of Romans 8, 28, 29, and 30, where the scripture says, um, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did for no, he did also what? Predestinate to be conformed to the what? Image of his son. Right there, temple motif. Temple motif. Temple motif. Is the son the temple? Yes. Did the son go through a manifestation, an assault, and then a resurrection? Yes. Will the people of God go through that? So do you see now when we talk about being conformed to the image of Christ that you and I must embrace suffering? Because in the embracing of suffering, God manifests his glory in the defense of his people over death, which they are susceptible to because they are God's witness. Y'all with me so far? Right, because the temple is the testimony of the true and the living God and his glory. The reason why there is no visible testimony in the world today, temple today, is because the enemy rules this world. And in God's sovereign purpose, he has chosen not to allow the church of the living God to be identified by one location and one building. And thus he said in John's gospel, chapter 4, verse 24 and 25, the hour is coming and now is when those that worship God will worship him in spirit and truth, not in Jerusalem, nor at Gerizim, that is in Samaria but in spirit and in truth, so that the temple is a mobile unit of a body of believers all over the world that worship God in spirit and in truth. So no longer can the enemy tear down a physical building, but he does kill the saints. But he can't kill us all. And so while he might knock some saints out over here, other saints are growing over here. So even right now, what I'm sharing with you is actually bringing you into Paul's desire of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18, that you might begin to, with all the saints, comprehend. That's what's happening now. Raise your hand if that's true. What's happening right now is you are beginning to comprehend with all the saints what is true about God's purpose for us in Christ in terms of his ultimate temple motif. And if we would go deep enough, we would be able to appreciate every aspect of the working of the body of Christ until that temple is completed, completed and fulfilled by the process of measuring. 
So I want to show you something, and then I'm going to shut it down here. Maybe we'll come back next week here a little bit. I'm going to uh, open up in chapter 40, because this is where chapter 40 starts. And in your own time, you can do this, just for the record. Chapter 37 is where it really begins. Chapter 37 is where God takes Ezekiel, his servant, and his Neo-Ezekian servant is John the Revelator. In other words, John receives the same visions that Ezekiel receives, but John's visions are advanced. And John is called to do the same thing that Ezekiel does that you and I are being called to do now. Take the scroll and eat it. Are y'all with me so far? So, so, so stay with me for a moment. We're just on the precipice. We're just on the brink. We're not going in. We can't. It's too late. But if we had time, we would. We're just knocking on the door, and I just want to see if the Spirit of God will allow us to do that. Can we do that? Right. So, so John was told to eat the scroll. Ezekiel was told to eat the scroll. It'll be sweet in your mouth, bitter in your belly. Why? Because God's word is a two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. It delivers and saves and it condemns and judges all rebels. But the people of God who are given the privilege of bearing witness to the glory of God have to enter into conformity to Christ by suffering for that witness. In other words, you and I have two high offices. The office of priesthood, where we pray for people, which is what the temple is all about. And the office of prophet, where we declare God's word to the world and the world hates us for it. Y'all got that? These were the two sides of James's 10 imperatives. Remember, the first side is communion. The second side is commitment to suffering. So we learn what it means to weep and mourn and cry. Why? Because the world hates God and we hate sin and it breaks our heart. And blessed are they that mourn. And blessed are you when you are persecuted. And blessed are you when you are spoken evil of for my name's sake, right? That's the edge that the prophet receives for telling God's word and truth, wearing the garments of sackcloth and ashes against a hostile, God-hating world. Well, the temple is always going to be attacked by the enemy because the enemy is seeking sovereign and exclusive worship over against the God that made him. Well, you and I are now the body of Christ. Is he not coming after the body? What Paul says is, to the degree that Christ dwells in your heart by faith, to the degree that the Spirit of God is building you up in your inner man, rooting and grounding you in Christ, to that degree he will allow you into the revelations of his glory concerning his eternal, immutable counsel, and that revelation will strengthen you so deeply that you'll be more than willing to take hits for Christ because you know that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in you and that glory impacting your soul from a knowledge of God at the depths of this kind of revelation will give you such a privileged 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 mindset that you would do just like the apostles did in the book of Acts they were glad to suffer for Christ's sake because the revelation of the glories of God that were given to them far outweighed the little bitty sufferings that they went through in the world so just touch this for a second. I'll, I'll just see if I can just, I'm just going to do a little touch and then I'm going to shut it down. You, you might get mad, but I'm going to shut it down. Okay, I'm going just, to just do this. I just want you to see this. This is, this is amazing. So Ezekiel 37 is about the dry bones. Israel's dead. And God promises a new covenant for a new people. Judah and, Jerus uh, Judah and Israel be brought back together. Ezekiel 37 is prophesying actually of the resurrection of the body of Christ through Christ's resurrection and the church by virtue of Christ's resurrection. That's the whole body, right? We were all dead spiritually. God raised us alive again. He brought us into a new eternal covenant. That's Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel 38, and then Ezekiel 39, we'll talk of, it talks about bringing us from the old land back into the promised land. Now think about this. Ezekiel 39 is where Ezekiel, who is what we call an exile prophet, he's in Babylon. God's telling him about the restoration process of taking the people back. The people are in Babylon under slavery to the Babylonian system. They have no word of promise about going back. 
They have no knowledge about returning to the land. They have no knowledge about the restoration of the temple or the glories of the gospel or the coming of Messiah or nothing. The only way that's going to come, watch this, is through his servant Ezekiel. But in order for Ezekiel to tell them something of this level, guess what Ezekiel has to do? He has to comprehend the width and length and depth and height of the love of God as represented in the temple. So I want you to put your feet in Ezekiel's shoes for just five minutes with me. Will you do that? And we'll just touch on just a few of the opening verses and kind of understand what's going on here. Ezekiel then, chapter 40, says this. And in the, in the five and twentieth year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, in the tenth day of the month, in the fourteenth year after the city was smitten, in the selfsame day, the hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me hither. Now, Ezekiel 40, verse 1, actually underscores so many rich redemptive truths that I don't have time to unfold them. The hand of the Lord is upon him. That is, the Spirit of Christ is now getting ready to deal with Ezekiel in deep revelatory uh, insights into God's plan. His spirit is upon him, but Ezekiel gives us some dates. I don't have the time to deal with them, but this is, as many have asserted, the Day of Atonement. A day of atonement in the year of Jubilee. A day of atonement in the year of Jubilee, which means the day of atonement is pointing to the finished work of Christ. The year of Jubilee is pointing to the release of God's people from bondage. Now, they don't know this, but Ezekiel does. And so a premise revelation given to Ezekiel is that God is working sovereignly on the very day that God has prophesied that if you obey, you will experience a Jubilee, right? If any man be in Christ Jesus, he's been set free, right? Right? There is therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. For the, spirit, the law of the spirit of life has done what? Set me free from the law of sin and death. Right? Whomsoever the Son shall set free shall be what? Free indeed. So Ezekiel is about to proclaim the gospel. Notice what it says in verse 2. And in the visions of God, brought me in, he brought me into the land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain by which was the frame of a city on the south. Do you see it? All right, don't blow your brains. Ezekiel has been transported by a vision back to Palestine. He's still way, way north in Babylon physically, but mentally he's back in the promised land. The Spirit of God has taken him by a nap of his hair, as he tells us, and has taken him to the promised land. So he's in the visions of God. Now watch what he says. He's standing on the top of the mountain. Now the metaphor of standing on the top of the mountain is the metaphor of a seer. The seer has the capacity to see far distances from the top of the mountain. So God has strategically placed Ezekiel where he can see all of Israel. And here's what he says. He says in verse 3, And then he says, By which was the frame of a what? City on the south. What do you think that city was? The temple. Not just Jerusalem, the temple. We'll talk about that next week. Now notice what he says, the frame of a city, not a city. The frame of a city. And when you talk about a frame, you are talking about what Paul just gave us in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18. A breadth, a length, a depth, and height. We got a frame. So stay right here. Now watch what this says. And he brought me thither, and behold, there was a what? Whose appearance was like the appearance of what? with a linen of flax in his hand and a measuring reed, and he stood in the what? All right, so we, we stuck now. Because the Spirit of God has brought him to a brother who in Jerusalem, the land of Israel, on the top of the mountain, seen out over the valley as an overseer, this brother is made of all brass. Who do you think this brother is? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is what we would call the pre-incarnate Christ because he has not incarnate, but he's in a post-resurrected state. How do we know that? Because Revelation chapter 1 tells us his feet were like fine brass. So he's already gone through the judgment. He's already died. He's already risen again. He's already ruling. And he's standing on the mountain with his servant Ezekiel. And this is what Peter meant when he says, And the Spirit of Christ which was in them did testify of his sufferings and glory. So Christ is about to testify to this brother. 
Now, how is he about to testify to this brother? In the same way that Paul is saying that we want God to testify to us about the breadth and the length and the depths and the height. Help me to comprehend. Help me to apprehend. Come alongside of me, Lord Jesus, by your spirit and walk me through this thing. Are you guys with me? So now watch this. Watch this. This is what he says. This is profound. He says, whose appearance was like that of brass, and he had a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed, and he stood at the gate. So I'm going to stop right here because this is too much for you, but I'm going to help you right now. He had in one hand what we call a soft ruler. Any carpenter would know that when he's building something, you have a soft ruler and a hard ruler. What do you mean by that? You have string that you use to measure things that have angles and contours and, and curves and things like that. And this flax that was in his head is a ruler. It's actually a rope, a corded rope. I wish I had time. A lot of gospel here. A corded rope that the carpenter uses to measure small things like tables and artifacts, like um, altars and lavers like chairs in the temple and dimensions that are only two to four to five to six to seven to eight uh, uh, feet long. That's your soft ruler. Your hard ruler is a rod. What he had in his hand, on, in his other hand, was a rod. The term here, it says, is a reed. In the Hebrew, it's actually a branch, a rod. A staff. It's what we would call a hard ruler, like the hard rulers we use that are our yardsticks when we're measuring with hard rulers because we want a straight edge. The reed, our staff, was about 12 feet high. A 12 feet high staff. You guys got that? Because he actually gives us the dimensions of it. I'm not taking the time to deal with it. So here comes Ezekiel by the Spirit of God meeting the Lord Jesus Christ on the mountaintop and their whole vision is about the temple and what Ezekiel sees is the resurrected Christ with two measuring lines in his hands a soft line and a hard line and guess what he's about to do he's about to take Ezekiel on an exquisite meticulous point by point journey through the temple to show Ezekiel the glory of those things that are certain are you hearing me to show Ezekiel the glory of those things that are certain. Because whatever God sees is. God doesn't guess. He doesn't speculate. God doesn't prognosticate. God doesn't have a crystal ball. God doesn't dream. You and I dream. God doesn't dream. Don't ever say God dreams. You and I have dreams. Dreams may or may not come to pass. When God sees a thing, it is. The reason why Ezekiel sees the Lord Jesus is because the Lord Jesus is the owner of the house, according to Hebrews chapter 3. The son is the owner of the house. Moses worked in the house, but the son owns the house. Now what he's about to do with Ezekiel is walk Ezekiel through every aspect of the temple. This is where I have sunk into, Lord, what should I do? Because there's so much here. But I'm asking for grace to carve out 10 messages to show you the beauty of the measuring. Because the measurements have deep symbolic meaning. Let me show you just a little bit of what's going on, not a whole lot, watch this. And the man said unto me, are you there? Son of man, behold with your eyes and hear with your ears and set your heart upon all that I will show you. Got it? You don't know, but that's what I pray for every time I open up in our study. That God would open our eyes. That he would open our ears. That he would give us hearts to receive his word. Because it just doesn't happen because you plop down in the chair and give your physical ears availability to vocal words. What we know according to Proverbs 20, 12 is... The seeing eye and the hearing ear, the Lord made them both. 
And what we know according to Matthew chapter 13 is that Jesus said to the disciples, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to those that are without, all these things are done in parables. And many of the prophets desire to hear and see these things that you are hearing and seeing, but did not. I might say this, that what Ezekiel was experiencing here some 400 years before Christ is what the apostles experienced with Christ as Christ went about Jerusalem doing his ministry. The Lord Jesus was measuring Israel as he preached and as he taught. And he was showing the disciples by topology the glory of those things that are certain in him about the kingdom of God. They were brought near to learn. Brought near to learn. Now watch this. Here it is. He says, Son of man, behold with your ears, your eyes, hear with your ears, and set your heart upon all that I will show you, for to the intent that I might show them unto you are you brought to me. Doesn't this sound like John's gospel? Chapter 16, verses 8 through 14. And when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will take the things of mine and show them unto you. He will take the things of mine and show them unto you. He will not glorify himself, for he will take the things of mine and show them unto you. Isn't this what Christ is doing with Ezekiel now? Letting Ezekiel know, I'm going to show you things that you could never see in order for you to do something for me that you couldn't do without me showing you this. Now notice what the text says. He says, and I will show thee for to this intent have I brought, have I had you brought to me. Declare all that you see to the house of Israel. Do you see it? Declare all that you see to the house of Israel. Now what is Ezekiel about to do? He's about to preach the gospel to national Israel that's in captivity to Babylon about a vision that doesn't have reality yet. He's about to let men and women that are in captivity know about a temple that God is revealing to him that's more real than any of the temples that went before or those that will come after. Now why is he doing that? Because he wants the children of God in Babylon to have the same experience that Paul and the church at Ephesus wanted the Ephesians to have that the Spirit of God wants us to have today. Because whether you know it or not, we are in Babylon. Whether you know it or not, there is a kind of captivity that we are dealing with. Whether you know it or not, we are not home yet. Whether you know it or not, what's going to keep us is a walk of faith and revelation in the glories of God in Christ where God shows us the certainties of the kingdom of God that strengthens us while we take the hits down here in this strange land. Whether you know it or not, we need to be drawn into these glories so that you and I can know that there's another world beside this carnal world that we're a part of. This is why Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, that the eyes of your understanding might be enlightened, that you might know the depths of the inheritance of the saints that's in Christ. You guys follow what I'm getting at? Right, and so what Ezekiel is about to go through, I'm not going to bore you with that, Ezekiel is about to walk with this brother as this brother measures. He's going to measure. And from chapter 40 to chapter 47, listen, he's going to measure. Over 36 times, he's going to measure the porch. He's going to measure the gate. He's going to measure the altar. He's going to measure the entrance. He's going to measure everything in the temple. What do you mean by measure? Know it intimately. At the level and depth of every aspect of it. Know it in its breadth. Know it in its depth. Know it in its height. Know it in its length. You know when you measure a thing, you know a thing. Am I making some sense? So, there's one more thing as we go. Listen to what it says. And behold, a wall on the outside of the house, round about, and in the man's hand, a measuring reed of six cubits long by the cubit and a hand breadth. So he measured the breadth of the building, one reed, and the height, one reed. Then he came unto the gate, which looketh toward the east, 
and went up the stairs thereof and measured the threshold of the gate, which was one reed broad, and the other threshold of the gate, which was one reed broad. And every little chamber was one reed long and one reed broad. And between the little chambers were five cubits and the threshold of the gate by the porch of the gate within was one reed. He measured also the porch of the gate within, and guess what it was? One reed. Then measured he the porch of the gate, eight cubits, and the post thereof, two cubits, and the porch, uh, and the porch of the gate was inward. And then he goes on developing what from uh, Ezekiel was an amazing process of discovery. Ezekiel could have never known what he saw unless there was a mediator interpreting for him by the measure what he saw. So watch this now. The mediator here is Christ. Christ is the one mediator between God and man. Christ is the revelation of the invisible God. Christ is the revelation. Christ is the interpretation. Christ is the interpreter. And for us, the only way we can know God is through Christ. And the only way we can know God's plan is through Christ. And Christ has to show us by measure what his purposes are for us. And Paul has already taught us in the New Testament that the reed and the rod, which is used for measuring, is the word of God and the gospel. That is the measure by which we measure the truth of everything in the kingdom of God. When we come back next week, we'll deal with that as well. Think about this. When Ezekiel traveled spiritually to the temple, I mean to Palestine, and he stood upon a mountain, the, the servant or the man here who was a man of brass, brass was standing where? At the gate. So what is the gate? It's entry into the temple. Who is the gate? into the temple Christ he says I am the door by me men enter in and find life so here the Lord Jesus is the way to the gate but he's also the gate right I am the way the truth and the life no one comes unto God but by me right he's not only the one that accesses the gate he is the gate and the reason I say that is because you missed it while in the measuring, the measurement was of one read, one read, one read, one read, one read. And what this teaches us is the equality of everything that's made. There is equality of everything that's made because the equality is the standard of one man and that one man is Christ. He is the measure by which everything that God does is good. Y'all with me right now? Right. And, 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 and see, Stefan is getting at it a little bit. But this takes us back to the Old Testament high priest and the ephod and the breastplate. And it takes us to the final, ultimate Jerusalem in Revelation 21, where the city was square. 144 cubits times 144 cubits are 12 times 12. And I told you the reed was 12 feet high. So one reed is 12, the other is 12. So if he stands it up vertical, it's 12. If he turns it horizontal, it's 12, right? If he elongates it, it's what? 12. So what we're dealing with is a square, right? And that square speaks to the equality of God's people in Christ. The unity and equality and perfections of God's people in Christ. You're going to see this running all the way through the book of Ezekiel. But like, see, right now, I'm way over our heads, aren't we? But you can sense a glory there, can't you? Because your heart is wide open to understanding that Hebrew, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse, verse 13, is what Paul means. Till we all come into the unity of the faith and into the full statue of the Son of Man. He is the measure, because he is the temple. But he is the revelation and the cause of the revelation. And something about this ought to make your heart rejoice when you think about the possibility of God bringing you into deeper depths of who he is over against this sinful, crazy world that's seeking to allure you into something that has nothing but death after it. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him and he will show them his covenant. Amen.